I believe we've heard a single first-hand account from a former military aviator. So one of my colleagues, Josh, has an example to show just why it would be important for NASA to also sh help shape how the data and information is reported. But before I turn the mic over to Josh, I want to make a recommendation to my fellow panelists that we consider advising NASA to more fully assess the cultural and social barriers to studying and reporting UAP, and for NASA to implement a plan to leverage its brand image to start removing these obstacles. But you just want to go up and then we'll, we'll take discussion after your presentation. So you can call it a slide deck if you want. <laughs> so it's not, it's not the charge of our panel to evaluate UAP evidence, uh, but part of our statement of task is to assess the scientific analysis techniques uh, that are available. You don't have to start it just yet. And, the, um, and how we might use them to determine physical constraints on UAP. Uh, you know, the UAP reports with the most detailed contextual information are the ones from the Navy aviators, uh, and they're using a com combination of, um, of ranging and uh, infrared imaging information. And for these cases, we can directly calculate critical parameters of a UAP, uh, such as altitude and velocity, under certain assumptions. Uh, and it's, you know, the main point I want to make here is that there, this multi-sensor approach is absolutely critical to um, charting a path forward for UAP investigations, and that pertains to NASA as well. So I'm going to provide one example here just to illustrate the crucial role of science and scientific analysis, um, and the role of scientific analysis to avoid misinterpretation in some sense. Um, next build. Just hit space. Yeah, OK, so this is um, this video was recorded by um, Pilots deployed from the aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt in 2015. Uh, the example has been given the nickname Go Fast because it gives an impression of an object moving very rapidly against the ocean surface. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the question is, is this impression correct? And, uh, you know, if not, what can we say quantitatively about what that object is doing in a uh, kind of Earth-centered coordinate system? Uh, Fortunately, the information needed to determine the altitude and velocity of this object is contained on the display. So go ahead and next. And uh, this includes the uh, elevation angle of the camera, um, the uh, azimuth angle of the camera, the target range in nautical miles, aircraft altitude, uh, the time reference in seconds, indicated airspeed in knots. Um, you know, this information in this video in particular has been discussed quite a bit on the, on the web. Um, so let's begin with the object altitude. Next, please. So knowing the jet's altitude and the bearing uh, to the target, we can apply basic trigonometry to figure out where that object is in altitude space. And it uh, turns out to be, you know, provided the range information is accurate, which uh, can have some uncertainties associated with it, but the object appears to be at about 13,000 feet. An important aspect of this here is that it's sort of midway between the, uh, the jet and the ocean. Uh, so it's the ocean that looks like it's right behind it is actually 4.2 miles away. And this is our first indication that some or most of the motion that we observe, the apparent motion of the object, uh, is in fact due to the rapid motion of the sensing platform, which is about 430 miles per hour in this case. Uh, but we don't have to guess about this. So we have enough information on this display to actually reconstruct um, the encounter. Go to the next slide, please. And uh, so this is what this is. This is using additional information on the screen, including the time axis. And um, so we know that this aircraft is banking about 15 degrees left, and you can compute through a simple calculator the radius, approximate radius of curvature of the flight. 
and um, you, the bottom line is, I won't go into detail here, but if you can get the bearing and range to the target at two locations with known separation in time, you can figure out how far it moved. And in this case, this object moved about 390 meters um, in 22 seconds, and that corresponds to a velocity of just 40 miles per hour. And so that's a velocity that's consistent with wind speeds at 13,000 feet. So it's not our task to conjecture what this object is, um, but it's an example that illustrates the type of data needed to determine critical parameters that will help us identify such ob objects going forward. Um, in addition to the importance of quantitative analysis, this example also serves to illustrate the, the kind of cognitive bias we have to contend with uh, for UAPs recorded <laughs> from unfamiliar perspectives. And uh, uh, Sean Kirkpatrick showed another example of that. This is, um, this is a parallax effect case. <coughs> Thank you. Any questions? Thanks. Um, actually, before we have questions, this is actually a good moment. Uh, Sean had wanted to comment on his one of the questions, if we, we bring Sean up and then yeah. take questions for everybody or more discussion. <laughs> Thanks. That was, that was actually very helpful for everyone, I'm sure. Uh, just one piece of clarification on the video that we showed, the second one that was the new, newly released one that had the three uh, aircraft in it. Uh, the question was asked about if it was a stabilized background against which the jitter was showing. I, I, I am not 100% certain of that answer. It might just be a bunch of dust on that sensor, but let me go back and get you a more fulsome answer. It is either stabilized background or it's just garbage. But in either event, the three aircraft are um, jittering because of the platform. But that's another example of exactly what you're saying, right? It's the perception of the of the operator who thinks it's doing something else when it's actually just your own camera. Right? Yeah, like just, Sean, in your event, it seemed to me that the, what you mean by jitter in this case is the, the plane is actually making motions that are causing a parallax. So it's actually m more than that. Uh, so the plane will move and that'll cause the parallax that you just showed. But the sensor, it's video as you see, right? Same idea. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in here. I think uh, make a couple of comments to just follow up on what uh, Josh said in my experience of flying, you know, over 15,000 hours, 30 something years uh, in airplanes and, and both in space. And the environment that we fly in, space or, you know, an atmospheric flight, very, very conducive to optical illusions. So I get why these pilots would look at that go fast video and think it was going really, really fast. Um, I remember one time I was flying in the warning areas off of uh, Virginia Beach military operating area there and my Rio thought, the guy that sits in the back of the Tomcat, was convinced we flew by a UFO. So I didn't see it. We turned around. We went to go look at it. It turns out it was Bart Simpson, a balloon. <laughs> you know, oftentimes in space I would see things and I was like, oh, that's really not behaving like it should. It's not it doesn't have the trajectory of a satellite or a planet on the back of the star field. And every single time when I would look at it long enough, I would realize that it was atmospheric lensing. It was the fact that what, what I was looking at was actually flying behind the atmosphere. And because of variations in the atmosphere, it made the trajectory look like it wasn't going in a straight line. It was going like this and it would go like that and it would turn in the other direction. Always was always the case. My brother, uh, Mark Kelly, a uh, former NASA astronaut, and uh, also now a U.S. Senator, I was with him for dinner last night, and he shared a story with me again that he had shared years ago, but I had kind of forgotten about it, and I think it's worth sharing. And that, 